Shall we just bow our heads together? Our kind and loving Father in heaven, we ask that the Holy Spirit will be very close to us, be with each one of us, especially be with me, so that the words that will be spoken would not be come from me, but would come from you as we open thy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's try. Great. This morning I have entitled my little talk that I want to share with you a love letter from God. I'll begin with a story. A story of a coded letter. Let me see if right. Sorry, I uh, spelled the name incorrectly. It should be C Y N, of course. Cynthia Riggs is an 81 year old fiction writer or mystery writer who lives in Martha Vineyard, Massachusetts, United States of America. Actually, she was divorced. Her children all grown up and left home. So she took up mystery writing as a hobby about 10 years ago, and she was very successful, written quite a lot of story and was very popular, very, very popular. And one day, of course, she was looking for clues every time to write a new book. And one day came a letter on a white piece of paper, a white piece of card, written this code. Can you read that? D, Z, O, O, F, S. Right. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, being a fiction writer or mystery writer, she got very interested. If I receive that or you receive that, the first thing we'll do will be what? But put it to the rubbish bin, right? <laughs> she didn't. She didn't. So she looked into it very carefully. And she suddenly realized there's a pattern. She suddenly realized pattern. She said, I have always been looking for clues, for new coded message, and here is one. Then she suddenly remembered. Sixty years ago, she lived, well, she worked in San Diego now. Massachusetts is in the eastern part of the United States. San Diego is in California, which is in the western part of the United States. So a bit like living in Sydney and Perth, right? It's not that close. Okay? She worked in California. In California, in San Diego, she met a nice young man by the name of Howard. Uh, let me see. What's Howard Atterby. They both work in the marine laboratory now. In San Diego, San Diego actually is the home of the U.S. Navy. So there's a lot of marine life and things like that there. And they used to pass time by passing coded messages to each other. They just do it for fun. And they become very friendly. All right? The code was very simple. Here is the scheme. If you find a letter B, you replace it by A, all right? You find a letter C, you replace it by what? D. If it's a D, you replace it by C. Simple enough, right? So they pass coded message to each other, and they will become good friends, but there wasn't any chemistry, okay? So they didn't have any romantic feelings. And, and Howard actually sensed that, even though that he knew that since he liked him, she wasn't treating him as a romantic companion at that point of time. So he never raised, never date him, her out at all. Well, Cynthia recognized that this was a coded message. So she decoded it. And what does it say? It says, Sina, I have never stop loving you. Howard, kiss, kiss. She immediately knew where it came from. Now remember, she's now 81 years old, right? Not like the photo we saw a few minutes ago. She's now 81 years ago. 
So she packed up straight away, flew from Massachusetts, Boston, all the way to Los Angeles, and took another flight down to San Diego and located how it to be. And asked, Did you write this message? He confessed, Yes, I sent that message. I sent that message. You know, how knew that she wasn't romantically attached to him, even though they were good friends, so he never expressed his feeling to her. But now, 60 years later, he packed up his courage and sent her this coded letter. At the end of the day, he proposed to her. She accepted. Now, the message was sent to her in 2012, and in 2000. 13, May, the two were married. Now, now, this fairy tale story, if you may like to call it that way, will probably would not have that happy ending if Cynthia simply grabbed that piece of cold letter and put it in the waste paper basket. Is that right? And didn't try to understand it. Did not understand it. Brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you that we too have a coded letter here. That is a personal letter that's sent to you, sent to me. Is that right? Some part of it is coded because sometimes it's not easy to read and understand it all. Is that right? Some passages are difficult to understand. Some passages are difficult to understand. And we have the tendency after reading two sentences or two words, well, Try it later on. And later on we forgot. We put it away. We put it away. But I want to submit to you, perhaps, perhaps, we should try carefully. And perhaps we should read carefully. Perhaps we should try to understand what the real message the sender has for us. And today, I want to share with you I want to share with you some simple principles and some simple techniques that we can read this letter or study this letter that will make it more relevant to us. Okay? Well, let me start with some basic theology. I'm going to give you two terms. The first term is called revelation, right? The second term is inspiration. What is the difference between revelation on the one hand and inspiration on the two hand? Now, those of you who have been to Evandale, you probably can, can write a big essay about these two letters if you're, you're a theology student or something like this. But let's do it in simple terms. Revelation is simply the process by which God revealed himself to us. He sent us a message. How? We're going to examine that in a minute. Inspiration is the process how God worked through his servant, human agencies, in order to re record, to express in human language what his message to us. Explain to us why we are here. Where are we going to? So these are two very separate, different things. If you carefully consider in Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, it explains to us how does God reveal to us, how did God reveal to us, and how God is continually revealed to us. We read, The heaven declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night uh, showeth knowledge. In other words, the first channel through which God revealed himself to us is through what? Nature. Is that right? Through nature. God spoke to us in nature. Day after day, nine after nine. That's the first channel that God speaks to us. If we go to read another text in the uh, New Testament this time, the text that Kimberly just read to us. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrines, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So the second channel, the second method that God revealed to us is through his word. Is that right? Through his word. So now let me summarize. What are the two channels that God revealed to us? Okay. Well, before I repeat that, okay, let's give the answer first. First is through nature. Second is through the, his word. Is that right? Now, at this point in time, I will want to pause a bit and I'll ask the deacons to hand out a little worksheet, worksheet so that you can uh, record what we just learned. Okay? And we just reviewed to you the answer to the first two questions. Revelation of God come to us in, through two channels. The first channel is nature. And the second channel is through his word. And the first channel, nature, is referred to as the general revelation. Okay? The general revelation. Where the second channel, the second channel is called special revelation. So we get the answer to the first question then? So the first answer is general revelation. And the answer to the second question is special revelation. Now, nature. Certainly you can find God's love in nature. Can you? If you observe nature, can you find God's love there? Of course. Nature is beautiful. Nature is this plenty of illustration. You look at how the mother hen look after little chicks, right? They are definitely God's love shown there. But if you look at nature alone, you also find cruelty. Have you? Can you find cruelty there? See, nature has been marred. It has been marred by sin. The revelation through nature is imperfect. This is why God also needs a second channel. That's that special revelation. He revealed to us through his word. Because by looking at nature, you probably will never quite work out what's the purpose of our existence. In fact, a lot of scientists look at that and discover that, well, there's no purpose. Right? So nature itself is an imperfect revelation. But through God's word, he, tell, he can tell us that what, what's the purpose of our existence? Where are we heading to? So that's what we call the special revelation. Now let us move on to the next text. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It reads here, that in the past, God spoke to our Father through the prophets, and at many times and in various ways. But at this last day, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heirs of all things, and through him he had made the universe. Now, we are now looking at how God revealed to us through his word. And Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tell us that in the past, God revealed to us through his what? Prophets. And those prophets not only revealed to us the spoken word, they also write it down, right? The written word. And that's what is here. Okay? So one form through which God's word was revealed to us is through the written word or the spoken word what is being spoken from there. So the answer to part C of question two is the written word, okay? Now let's turn to John chapter one, verse one and 14. What does that say there? It said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. And the word become what? Flesh, become flesh. That means he become a human being. 
and live among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what it's saying is that God not only revealed to us through the written word, he also revealed to us through Jesus, the living word. Is that right? So we now have two forms in which God chose to reveal himself to us. Firstly, through the written word. Secondly, through the living word. Now, this is important. Written word alone is not sufficient. Living word alone to us is not sufficient. It's sufficient for Christ. Because we human beings cannot be with Christ all the time because we are limited in time and space, where the written word can reach us, right? So both forms are very important. So the answer to the second question then is the distinction between the written word and the living word. <clears throat> now I like <clears throat> to spend a bit of time to consider some general principles of Bible study and some general guidelines, or I should say techniques, to study the written word and the living word as well. Firstly, let me nominate some general principles. I have five here. I'm sure you can add more, but they are the ones that come to mind. In fact, I have to confess, my sermon actually was adapted from one of uh, Spurgeon's sermon, and this is some of the points that he had mentioned, and I find it very uh, uh, useful for me. Firstly, read intelligently. Don't read too fast, nor too much. Have some objective in mind, some object in mind. Feed yourself, and suddenly, frequently, and consistently. Now, let us consider one by one. When you receive a letter from your bank or your credit card company, do you say, oh, this is a beautiful letter. I've been looking for it for a long time. Let, let, let me open it and read it straight away. Do you do that? Perhaps you should read it straight away in case you owe some money, right? <laughs> but not too many of us are very exciting, are we, about receiving a letter from your credit card company. In, in fact, nowadays we use email so much that any letter comes to the mailbox, mostly abuse, aren't they? <laughs> Not many personal letters come through there. In fact, I was delighted to, uh, this week that I got a, uh, got a card from my grandchildren, a uh, Father's Day card. You know, Father's Day in, in, in America is in June, so different from your time. So I, I observed two, seven, uh, two Father's Day in a year. So my Australian grandchildren will give me one. What, what do we have? What day? September. September, right. And then in June, I will get another one. <laughs> Okay, which I got double present, which is very good. <laughs> anyway, so if it's a personal letter, you would treat it very, very, very preciously. But, but those emotions, the, the happiness, the joy, is not reserved for bills or for bank letters or credit card companies or, or your energy uh, bills and all these things. Fifty years ago, uh, when my wife, uh, actually my girlfriend at that time, and I were courting, we, we wrote to each other every day. Right? So we were real good supporters of Australia, Australia Post. Right? <laughs> That's why you still have Australia Post. If we haven't written every day, you, that, that institution will be gone. Well, un un unfortunately, we don't have email at that time. If it is, I would save a lot of money. I would still get the same lady. Right? But, but we have to write. And we numbered one, two, three, and I remember we got to 650-something, I remember. Okay. And uh, before we, we decided that's enough. <laughs> we know each other well enough. And no, let you imagine that time I received a letter from my girlfriend. I would open it, would I read the first sentence, and then I put it away, Go and have a, a cup of a, a, a cup of, of Milo first, 
and then come back read the second sentence, and then go and do a bit more homework, and then come back read the third sentence. Do, do you think I would do that? What would I do? I'll read it from the first word to the last word. In fact, I was so bad, I tried to read in between the lines. <laughs> Although she didn't write anything in between lines. <laughs> because, because what? That letter, that message comes from someone is important to you. Is that right? And does this message come from someone important to you? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Therefore, we should read the Bible, the scripture, intelligently, carefully. Don't just cross over it casually. Okay? Do not read too fast or too much. Now, butterfly flew around and go to all the different flowers. It cover more grounds, but it is the bees that gets honey. It flew slower, but it gets the nectar, the sweetness from the real message. So imitate the bee, not the butterfly. Imitate the bees, not the, not the butterfly. <clears throat> the second point contained in this point was don't eat too much. You know, sometimes even food that are good, tastes good or good for you, if you have too much, it may produce the opposite effect. Is that right? Let me sign another example because my wife gave me a lot of good examples. She told me about a story when she was a child. My father-in-law has, do you know how many girls he has? Five. They stopped after that. <laughs> they didn't dare to try. <laughs> they, were, they were really wanting to get a boy, but they got five girls. At one stage, my father-in-law got really obsessed with the health benefits Benefits of wheat germs. You know, wheat germs are good food, right? They're good for you. So, she wanted to make sure that all her five daughters have plenty of wheat germs. So when they have bread, he will mix wheat germ with butter, put it on bread. When they had rice, they will put soy sauce and wheat germ together and put it on rice. When they have ice cream, he will sprinkle some wheat germs on it. Now, would you like to ask my wife whether he liked weak germs? <laughs> she wouldn't touch it. So even something that's good, too much, can produce the opposite effect. Is that right? So, um, yeah, you can have too much of even Bible reading. I don't know whether you have seen, but I have, have seen in my life, many cases, I have seen very... People who are so enthusiastic about Bibles, but in a few years, they completely turn around. They completely turn around. So, we need to have, do not read too fast or too much. Point number three, three. Have some objective in mind. Now, I know if you go to the Bible, randomly open a text and read it, God will still bless you. You will get something. But if you have something in mind, I want to learn about forgiveness. Try to read the text that's related to forgiveness. God will guide you. The Holy Spirit will guide you and give you a real blessing if you have something in mind. Suppose one day you walk into my office and saw me, hey, looking under my desk, looking under my chair, looking in between the books, and you ask me, Bruce, what are you doing? I say, I'm just looking. And what are you looking for? I'm not looking for anything particular. I'm just looking. What would you think? You would think Bruce is a nut, right? <laughs> Bruce is a nut. What do you look for without knowing what you look? Tweedledee and Tweedledum once say that. If you want to go nowhere, you sure will get there, right? <laughs> so have something in mind. Have an objective when you study the Bible. You will get a real blessing. You will get a real blessing. Number four, learn to feed yourself. Well, when we were babies, when we were a child, we liked to eat soft foods, pureed foods. But when we grow up, our tastes become more sophisticated. We eat adult foods, right? We go to the originals. 
we will eat the carrot rather than puree the carrot. We eat the potato, we we'll bake the potato rather than smash potato all the time. So mm -hmm. that's the way. It may be, there may be a case for us to go to a book that write about certain subject in the Bible to help us understand something. There may be a case for us to go to watch a DVD, DVD that talk about Revelation or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But let us not stop with that, but let us go directly to the original source itself. Read it from there. God will help you. God will bless you. Eat adult foods, because that what is for us. Feed yourself is the next point. Now I'm sure you have completed item I in point three, right? Point number five, study frequently and consistently. In other words, when you study the Bible, don't do it one day and then forget it the rest of the week or whatever the case. You should do it consistently and frequently. Little Mary was playing there with her doll, and mother said to Mary, Mary, put, up, put away your doll, now time for Bible study. And Mary loved Bible study, so he, she put away her doll and come to mommy to have Bible study together. And Mary tell mother, Mom, mommy, can we study grandpa's Bible? Mother say, why? Grandpa's Bible is the same as our Bible? Oh no, she say. Grandpa study his Bible every day. We only study our Bible once a while. His Bible much more interesting. <laughs> and mother get the message. So if we want the maximum benefit from Bible study, we should study frequently and consistently. Frequently and consistently. Now, I'd like to move into something more concrete now. I'm talking about specific techniques, specific techniques for Bible study. And I will enunciate six. Of course, I'm sure you can add others as well. I call them the six method. The first one is called the telescopic method. Second one is called the microscopic method, repetition method, thematic method, or word and expression center approach, and Bible character approach. Okay, let us now consider one by one. The telescopic method refer to the fact that we use a broad switch. We look at the overview of the entire book of a Bible. We don't get bogged down by small minute details, but look at it as an entire passage to find what is its theme, what it's trying to convey to us, what is its message. Let's just take one example. Uh, if you have the Bible, if you open to the book of, of Job, all right? Job, Job is just before Psalms, okay. And uh, book, book of Job is a very popular during election time because everybody is talking about Job, Job, you know. So, so the book of Job, it has a total of forty-two chapters. If you want to read the whole thing, it's take a long, take a while. And by reading the details, sometimes we can get lost. What is the main, main point? But if you look at it as whole, you stand back and look at it using a telescope, you will find that the book of Job naturally fall into five sections. Five sections. Firstly, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, theologian usually refer to that as the, uh, the prologue. The prologue described Job as a righteous, blameless man. And then Satan, appear in heaven, want to inflict him. Right? And God allowed Job to be tested. That's the background. That's chapter 1 and 2. Basically, that's it. Okay? Then chapter 3 to chapter 27, quite a lengthy passage, we usually refer to as the dialogue. 
That means the conversation between two people, dialogues. And in fact, what's the conversation? This is the conversation before, between the three friends of Joe and Joe himself. Okay, the three friends are Elathas, uh, Bildad, and Zophar. They all came. They, they, they really sympathetic with Joe, what he's suffering. But each of them have the wrong theology. He said, that, Joe, you must have seen. You must have done something wrong. That's why you got inflicted. Joe said, no, no. I know where I stand with God. So they have some sort of argument, if you like, some sort of dialogue. So this is the human wisdom, you like to call it, human counsel. His friend tried to give him advice, but from a human point of view. Then, the next section, section 3, is in chapter 28. It introduces the concept of what real wisdom are. The true wisdom. True wisdom come from God. In chapter 28. Then, chapter 29 to chapter 42, or the beginning of chapter 42, we refer to that as the monologue. The monologue means each person talking alone, okay? Not a conversation, not a dialogue. A monologue. The three persons that talk is Job himself, his friend Elihu, and then finally God himself spoke. So these are the three monologues on chapter 29 to 42. And finally, in 42, is the epilogue, that God's final wording, and how God restored Job to full health and full wealth again. So that's basically the whole message. In some sense, it actually reflects your experience and my experience in this world, isn't it? We were born, we were probably born happy, then we got inflicted the problem, the sin of this world. And then we had dialogue with the people of the world. And finally we find the wisdom. And finally we talk to ourselves in our monologue. Come to realization that only in relying on God, trusting in God, we will be saved. That's what the message is all about. That's all the message. Okay. The second method is the exactly opposite, the reverse to the first one. The first one is telescopic method. The second method is the microscopic method. In here, we, we analyze the detail, the inner meaning, the full hidden meaning of a passage of a passage. Well, let's take one example here in Galatians uh, chapter 6 verse 7. We read, Do not be deceived. God is not mock. For whatever a man soweth, that he will also reap. Well, first we consider deceive. What does it mean to be deceived? Can we be easily deceived? Can we not be deceived? How can we not be deceived? God is not mocked. What does that mean? God is mocking me? Mocking human race? Or he, we cannot mock him. Whatever a man soweth, what can be sowed? Can we not sow anything? Do we have a choice? By making decision. Have we not already sold something? And then the final say that that he will also reap. That seemed to be a surety. If you sow, you will reap certain things. So we try to analyze in great detail what the meaning of that passage. That's the microscopic method. The third method is called the repetition method. This is is done by reading the same passage of the Bible again, again, and again. When we first start reading it, we may find it hard to understand. But what happens after you're reading it a few times? 
Now, I can remember when I was doing my, well, Roy would know it, and Michael would know it too, I was doing my BSc in, in, in London University, and we, I chose physics. Those of you who know anything about science, physics, one of the most difficult topics is thermodynamics. Is that right? Did I got it right? Thermodynamics is one of the most difficult subjects. And my teacher told me, read this section of thermodynamics once. I said, yes, I read it already. I can't understand it. Read it again. So I go and read it again. I said, sir, I still cannot understand it. He said, read it again. Sir, I cannot understand it. Go and read it again. Sir, I cannot understand it. He said, you keep reading it until you read it 13 times, and it does not matter whether you understand it or not, you know it by that time. Is that true? Is that true? By repeating it, by reading it again and again and again, the concept comes here, right? Don't on me. What is thermodynamics? I was able to answer the question and get 100% on that. All right? But that's some time too. Let us be persistent. Let us be persistent and insistent. Using the repetition method, we will get there. <clears throat> the fourth method is the thematic method. In other words, we take a theme from the Bible, particular concept, a theme from the Bible, and study it in full detail. Let me take an example uh, in Matthew 23, verses 1 to 36. Now, if you have your Bible, you may want to, to, to uh, turn to that. But don't be afraid, I won't read the whole, I won't read the whole chapter for you today. Otherwise, you will be here the rest of the day. But, um, this is a very interesting topic, uh, chapter because Christ got stuck right into the scribes and the Pharisees. What is the famous phrase in here? It says that, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And Christ said that, how many times? Eight times. Same thing again and again and again. And I think the first time was in verse 13. No, let's just read that part. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entered to go in. You don't want to go in yourself, and you don't want others to go in. Well, those are strong words, right? I hate to be on the receiving end of that statement. And if you continue on verse uh, 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. 16, woe to you, uh, scribes and Pharisees. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, verse 25, same again. And again. If we want to know what Christ is getting at, we need to study each of those passages and find out what he's trying to say. If you think about after reading those texts, you'll find that what Christ is saying is that if you proclaim to be a Christian and yet, in fact, you practice the opposite of the principle of Christianity, you are in real trouble, isn't it? You are in real trouble. You will be worse than those heathen that who have never even confessed to be Christians. That's the message. That's the message. Okay. Number five, word and expression. Or word-centric, expression-centric method. If you have a concordance like Strong's concordance or your, uh, your, uh, Young's concordance, or sometimes even at the back of your Bible you may have a concordance, you can look up a word and find out all the Bible passages that have that word, right? You know what a concordance is? Then, that's a good way. In other words, you look up all the texts that use that word. By looking at it from different angle, you would find what is meaning. Now, we are now in the computer age. Things are so much easier. I don't have to carry the heavy, heavy in fact, I was going to carry a strong con concordant with me, and it, it was too, too heavy, even with my backpack. So I decided not to carry it away. We can just go to the computer. 
Here is a very beautiful website called BibleGateway.com. It's free. Okay? You type in a word, for example, the word foolishness, all right? And ask it to search. Boop, it comes. 20 references in the New King James Version talking about the word foolishness. And the nice thing about Bible Gateway is, I'm not doing advertising, but the nice thing about it is that it has different versions of the Bible. Okay? If you want Spanish Bible, well, it gets you. All right? Type in the Spanish word, you'll find it. And, and if you want the Chinese version, it's in there too. Okay? So, you can do anything. Um, and it's a wonderful way to study about words or expression. You can put in an expression as well. It will search for you. Method number six is characters, Bible character center. In other words, we take a particular character, a person, about in the Bible and study a bit of story around it. Now, one of the most intriguing story, I think, is the story of Jonah, right? The story of Jonah in the Bible, is, it has all elements like a fairy tale, as a real thing, as a tragedy, as well as a comedy, right? It's, why? Because Jonah's just like you and me, all right? He can be on fire for God, but he can be challenging God the next minute. He can be cursing people, but then he can be loving people. He can be honest, and he can be deceptive. Just like you and me. That's what the story is there. It's, it's not a fish tale. It's not a fish story. In fact, it's a fish story with a lesson. So, this is method number six. Character center method. So, we'll, let us just Quickly review, telescopic method, microscopic method, repetition method, thematic method, using word and expression-centric method, and character-centric method. Now, doesn't matter how many uh, techniques, good techniques, or good principles you use, that is not enough. Brother, sister, the most important thing is that you should love the author of the letter that's sent to you. If we have a relationship with the author, then this book has a different meaning to us. Jen, in her graduation party, Jen is a final year psychology student. He met a handsome young engineering professor, Richard who presented her with a graduation gift. Though he had met him a few times on the campus while on her way to the library and had a few conversations with him, they only knew each other as friends at that stage. She gratefully accepted the gift and thanked the young professor. That evening after the party, she returned to her dormitory room to retire. She opened the gift a quick glance on the, on the cover, she understood that this is a hydraulic engineering textbook that the professor had written. It's a subject that he has not a single bit of interest. So, without even opening the cover, she put it on the top shelf of the bookcase behind, besides her bed and forgot about it. Well, several months later, the young, two young people get to know each other more and they, Jen and Richard, fell in love. As their friendship grew, the young couple start to talk about wedding plans. One evening, as they were strolling along the river walk, the young professor asked Jen, how do you like the graduation gift that I gave you? <laughs> wow, she felt embarrassed. She promised herself that right at that moment she must treat her lover much better than this. So that evening, when because she had completely forgotten about it, so that evening when she returned back to her room, she took out the book and started reading it and discovered on the fly page the young professor has written a beautiful dedication 
to her. She even knew, did not know that the young professor was in love with her that early. Now she discovered it was a beautiful, moving dedication. She go from page one to page two. Those mathematical formula were still there. Those engineering terms were still there. She could not understand it, but they were interesting. She read every single one, even the Greek alphabets, alpha, beta, gamma, and all these things. Every single thing was so interesting. Now, let me ask you the question. What made the difference? This book that was so interestless, no interest to her a few months ago, now suddenly become positively gripping. What made the difference? Because she now is in love with what? The author. The author. The author. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Do you love the author of this letter that has been sent to you? Thank you. May God bless you.